So I've been blessed by my devotion time. And I want to encourage you to spend more time, have some personal devotions, and, uh, and just start your day on the right foot. Uh, because um, it falls apart all by itself anyway. But if we can start with the Lord's help, uh, we'll have gain that thank you for Well, um, does anybody here need grace? I, I absolutely need grace. Is it best when the grace comes just in time? Absolutely. You know, um, As I was thinking about grace, you know, grace doesn't do the work for us, though, does it? Grace just encourages us That's not the way. We still need to be faithful. But that shock of encouragement at the right time makes, uh, makes our duties pleasant. The things we need to do makes it possible. Well, I want to share this morning uh, from the devotional that uh, that I was reading, and it's uh, God's Amazing Grace, March first. And I'd like to share that. Uh, the title is Heaven's Highest Attraction. And uh, each of the devotional starts with a Bible and scripture verse. And uh, this one is, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Hebrews 4, 16. That's a beautiful verse, isn't it? I don't know about you, but I don't do very many things boldly. <laughs> Continuing here in uh, God, uh, God's Amazing Grace, it says, After pointing to Christ, the compassionate and the intercessor who is touched with the feelings of our infirmities, the Apostle says, Let us therefore, therefore come boldly unto the throne. The throne of grace represents the kingdom of grace, where the existence of a throne implies the existence of a kingdom. A kingdom of grace. Beautiful. Continuing, God's appointments and grants in our behalf are without limit. That made me pause for a little bit. God's appointments and grants in our behalf are without limit. The throne of grace is itself the highest attraction, because occupied by one who permits us to call him Father. Beautiful. Call him Father. But God did not deem the principle of salvation complete while invested only with his own love. By his appointment he placed as uh, he has placed at his altar an advocate clothed with our nature. As our intercessor, his office work is to introduce us to God as his sons and daughters. It's beautiful, isn't it? Not strangers. Christ intercedes in behalf of those who have received him. To them he gives power by virtue of his own merits. To become members of the royal family, children of the heavenly king. And the Father demonstrates his infinite love for Christ, who paid our ransom with his blood, by receiving and welcoming Christ's blood. As his word. He is satisfied with the atonement made. He is glorified by the incarnation, the live death, and mediation of his son. No sooner does the child of God approach the mercy seat and he becomes the client of the great person. At his first utterance of penitence and appeal for pardon, Christ espouses his. And makes it his own. 
presenting supplication before the Father as his own request. Lord, we need to pray more, don't we? We need to seek the Lord more. Christ working on our behalf. Presenting our needs and requests to the Father. That's his fault. As Christ intercedes on our behalf, the Father lays open all the treasuries of his grace for our appropriation. The Father lays it open. To be enjoyed and to be communicated to others. Ask in my name, Christ says. I do not say that I will pray the Father for you, but the Father himself loves you. Because you have loved me. Make use of my name. This will give your prayers riches. And the Father will give you the riches of his grace. Wherefore ask, and ye shall receive, that your joy may be full. John 16, 24. How much more efficient would our lives and our days be if we could remember to spend more time in prayer? More time speaking to our Lord and Savior. And in turn, he is presenting to the Father as the treasuries grace open before us to be used. It's a beautiful, beautiful gift. So I was thinking about this. Uh, Grace and mercy. The roads that we are on. Everyone outside here is on that same road right there. Just depends on what intersection that they're on. Are they seeking grace or mercy? Or are they at a different corner in their life? You know, even once we receive grace and mercy, we get it again and yet again. God is so understandable, so gracious to us, so merciful to us, that He does not withhold as we see Him. I'd like to look once again at Hebrews 4. I'll read more verses here, starting in verse 11. Hebrews chapter 4. Bold. 
and uh, you can reply that, that question full. How about you? Maybe with family? Some people can be bold even with strangers. And they have the gift of saying how it is. I, uh, I didn't grow up that way. I, uh, I'm, I'm working on that. The Lord is giving me strength to speak boldly about His love and His care that He has manifested so many times just in my life. Does anyone here claim to be bold? <laughs> That's a hard thing to be, isn't it? To be bold. I pray that we're encouraged to be bold as we should be. Let's turn and look at Ephesians chapter 6, 18 to 20. Ephesians chapter 6, starting in verse 18. It says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watched to this end, with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints, and for me, that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador of chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought. Now today, none of us are in chains, but here, even in chains, wants to speak more as he ought to. The good news. So when people speak boldly to you, do you listen more? A lot of times, sometimes it's easier to buy what they're selling. <laughs> well, I think this is like a double here. Maybe this would be good for each of you. <laughs> Not a very good sales pitch, is it? <laughs> Not a very good uh, presentation. Unless there is that boldness. There is that life experience. There is the reality. God's love in your hearts and lives. And you can share it boldly because you do have an experience. You've seen the blessing that it is and needs to be in hearts and lives. Sharing it boldly. You know, a lot of times it's easy to share a testimony, isn't it? We can share that boldly because it's our personal experience. The way Christ has shown himself to work on our behalf. The testament. So I pose the question, how often do we speak our testimony? How often do we share the grace that we have been given? I shared a little bit two weeks ago. Uh, I shared a little bit two weeks ago in Sabbath school class about how I was using a chainsaw to cut up a tree that had fallen in my brother-in-law's yard. And uh, as I was sawing, a chain came up. And, uh, and I realized one of, the, one of the nuts was missing. And of course, there is about uh, 14 inches of snow on the ground. <laughs> There's sawdust everywhere, pine needles and branches and everything. And 
die. So I had taken the chainsaw back up to the truck to put it back together, and then I realized I was missing one of the nuts. And uh, it's not really safe to run a chainsaw that the bar could slip and the chain would come around and wrap around. So uh, I needed to find that nut. And so uh, you know, I said a quick prayer. Lord, it is your will. Please help me to find this nut. And all of about 12 seconds later, <laughs> this strange thing hidden under some pine needles. What is that? That is the nut that I need. So fast. You know, I, I praise the Lord that I wasn't frustrated with myself. But I had the, the clarity of mind to present it to the Lord. Lord, it's your will. And he quickly, he shared, and he showed, he enlightened my eyes to find it. And I could continue working, being productive, and moving forward. I had two other helpers there, they, you know, me went away to go find another bowl. It's not always the best thing. But you know, the Lord, he helped in that situation quickly. Easily. And I just wanted to share that because that's part of my testimony. It happened to me. And I can. I can share that. Well, because it's real. Another time, I was uh, changing the tire. I didn't realize this was going to be animated. <laughs> but uh, I was uh, working on a pickup truck. I was probably 20, something like that, and uh, it had a flat tire. And of course, what you know, it's parked on a hill. <laughs> but it was dark and drizzly, and I started jacking up the, uh, the truck, and uh, I put it on the underneath the axle to pick it up. And what you know, as I lifted it off the ground, the truck started to roll. The tire was already off, and the jack was stabilized by an angel. It came off of the axle, stood up, and caught the leaf springs of the truck before it came down to pressure. Mm -hmm. So I can share that boldly because it happened to me. I saw an angel keeping me from being pinned to the ground with no one around in the dark, you know, lady. God is intervening in our lives. And we need to share it. We need to remember it. Help it to come to our lives. And we want it to be a blessing to those that we share it with. But I pray that gives us some boldness. You know, there's, I've had answers to prayer in my life that just, I had forgotten about them already. <laughs> I had prayed for weeks and weeks and months. And then, my time was there. And God made it happen. So, there are there are things that we want to be able to share boldly with those around us. So coming back to grace, grace to help is I don't need. You know, I was trying to think about uh, grace as a child. If you're fighting with your siblings, and you see that you're wrong, grace is for them to just not bother you about. But grace to help is for them to help put all the pillows back on the couch, right? There's grace, and then there's grace that helps. So it's a step beyond. Well, let's turn and look here at Proverbs. Proverbs 22, verses 10 and 11. Here I think of 
with David and Jonathan as good friends. Proverbs 22, verses 10 and 11. It says, Cast out the scoffer, contention will lead, yet strife and reproach will cease. He who loves purity of heart and has grace on his lips, the king will be his friend. You know, I want to have Jesus the King be my friend as well. Don't you? Mm. Purity of heart. You know, as I was studying that, it also uh, it also referred to purpose. Purity of purpose. And uh, it's very important. You know, but there's a balance to grace, isn't there? You know, we have grace that's given to us. It gives us strength that empowers us to make a better decision. And yet there's a balance to that. Mercy is good. But grace leads us to repentance, doesn't it? As we nourish repentance, gives us faith to stand. And then, as we have faith and stand, we walk in obedience. I want to look here at another passage in Hebrews. But I want to share the thought that grace teaches us, but it doesn't enable us to continue in sin. Hebrews 12, verses 1 through 17. surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us lay aside every and the sin so easily apparent. Are you surrounded by a cloud of witnesses? I have children. Yes. They're, they're witnesses. What I've done. What I do. My co-workers. Brothers and sisters. Here. Witnesses. Let us lay aside every week the sin which so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. This is part of the, the complementing part of grace. We still have a race to run. We still have endurance to build. We still have a place that we need to get to work. Running that race. Verse 2 Looking up to Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has set down at the right hand of the throne of God. He's interceding for us now, isn't he? Praise God. His office is to intercede for us as we pray, as we surrender. Our will would be his will. Verse 3. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. You have not yet resisted to bloodshed and strive against us. You know, when we think of it, yeah, we'll have difficulties have trials, we'll have opposition. 
And yet Christ had all of those things. And said, Father, forgive them, for they know not. Continuing in verse 5. And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as a son. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord. Nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and scourges every son whom he receives. If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father is not chastened? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. That means it's not going to be all grace, all peace, all easy, is it? Chastening is for our good. But there's grace that gives us that boost. To see the chastening for what it is. God's love reaching out to us. Turning again here to verse 9. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and, who, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in, in subjection to the Father of Spirit and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he from our God. That we may be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterwards it yields the peaceable fruit of To those who have been trained by it. I don't know about you, but there's something about a peaceful. Peaceful peace. Not contention, not strife. It doesn't always happen that way, though. <laughs> Sometimes there are children. Sometimes it's me. Just chasing it, that's me. You know, but as that chastening happens, there's grace. There's grace that lets it go. And there's grace that helps to put the pillows back on the couch. We're not continuing to beat each other up. We're not continuing to keep score. We're not continuing to keep a black Afterwards, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Verse 12, therefore strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees. I don't know about you, but I've, I've been growing in my faith. Feeble knees, boy, that's me. Hands that hang down and don't know exactly what to do. Lord be with us. Therefore, strengthen the hands which hang down and the feeble knees and make straight paths for your feet. So that which is lame may not be dislocated, but rather is the seat. Pursue peace with all men and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. Wait a second. Fall short of the grace of God. How could they fall short of the grace of God? Have developed the love of the truth, have they? Have they fallen short of the grace of God? The truth is still the truth. Righteousness is still righteousness needs to be part of our understanding, part of our growth, part of our goal to be headed to us. 
looking diligently lest anyone fall short of the grace of God. That kind of made me pause and think a little bit. We think of grace, grace that covers all of our sins. And it does. And yet, there's a part here that says we need to look diligently at it, lest we fall short of God's grace. Lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, by this we may become divine. Lest there be any fornicator, profane person like Esau, who for one morsel of food sold his wish. For you know that afterward, when he wanted to inherit the blessing, he was rejected, for he found no place for repentance, though he sought it diligently. He didn't turn back from his error. He cherished that error. He lost the blessing. The Lord helped us not to do that. To fall short of that opportunity of grace. You know, as I was uh, prepping for the sermon, I was going through my, I used my uh, EG White app as a, a filter to find scripture verses, passages. And so in the, in the app, I put, found grace, or find grace. Grace or faith. And you know, there's a lot of these grace, found grace, is different. You know, Noah found grace in the eyes of God. Lot found grace when he was asking the angels, do I have to go to the mountains? I want to go to the small city. So, so, you found grace. Okay, you can go to that small city. Jacob I don't know about you, but your brother coming towards you with 400 men is a little bit of a challenge. I want to look at that a little bit this morning. Let's turn to Genesis 33. Uh, talk a little bit about Jacob's time of trouble. Genesis 33. Esau. 
his brother ran to meet him and embraced him. Fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. And he lifted his eyes and saw the women and children and said, Who are these with you? Children of the God, whom God has graciously, graciously given to the servant. Skipping to verse 8, it says, And Esau said, What do you mean by all this comfort which I have? And he said, These are to find favor in the sight of God. To find grace is also the same thing. To find grace in the sight of God. So, so here Jacob found grace in his brother's eyes. But he still had to go there. He still had to put his family in order. He still had to face the 400 men. Man. I gave grace to Jacob in his blood. No longer trying to kill him. And put an end to him. Continuing in the list, Joseph found grace or favor. In the eyes of Pharaoh, when he wanted to go and bury his father back in his home. Moses, for many times where it says, Moses found grace at the end. I'd like to look at that as well this morning. Moses is conflicted because 
there's a lot, a lot required of them. Continuing in verse 13, it says, Now therefore I pray, if I have found grace in your sight, show me now your way, that I may know you, and that I may find grace in your sight, and consider that this nation is your people. So there's grace to help, isn't there? But that grace isn't the full aspect. There's still work to be done. There's still things to be faithful about. Moving forward. Verse 14, and he said, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said to him, If your presence does not go with us, do not bring us up from here. For how then will it be known that your people and I have found grace in your son, except that you go with us? So we shall be separate, your people and I, from all the people who are upon the face of you. I invite you to continue reading that, maybe this afternoon. How Moses speaks to the Lord as a friend. So there's grace to help, but there's still our part to be done. Just as Moses has found grace in the sight of the Lord, he still stood up to responsibility. He still had a job to do. And he was faithful. In that time. Continuing on the list here, we had Gideon. I didn't realize before that I had studied this, but there was a sacrifice that Gideon had made. And an angel came and consumed that sacrifice. It's interesting. I, for whatever reason, I have missed that. And then later, we found grace, but the, the landscape, the sign of the Lord, leading them, leading his people out of oppression and out of sin. That Gideon was to be that instrument. He found grace, but he still had work to do. He had to move as the Lord left. And then we have Ruth. And you know what she says? Why have I found grace in your sight? <laughs> Why have I found grace in your sight? Even though I'm a foreigner. Let's turn and let's look at that scripture. Uh, let's turn to Ruth chapter 2. starting in verse 10. Right after Judges. Judges number eight. Ruth chapter 2, verse, uh, verse 10 to 12. Then she fell on her face, bowed down to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your eyes? That you should take notice of me, since I am before. And Boaz answered and said to him, It has been fully reported to me all that you have done for your mother life, since the death of your husband. And now you have left your father and your mother and the land of your birth, and have come to a people whom you do not know before, did not know before. The Lord repay your work, and a full reward be given you by the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for that. Beautiful, beautiful picture. There again, Ruth has found grace, favor, 
and the sign of Bolton. But you know what? She's still out there working in the heat of the day, gleaning grain, being diligent. She has work to do. But she's found grace. I have made that work so much more pleasant, so much easier. Now she's diligent because she's seen that grace, that faith that the Lord gave her. I want to continue. There's another passage. Uh, this one is in Christ's object lesson, so that I'd like to read in closing. not the length of time we labor, but our willingness and fidelity in the work that makes it acceptable to God. Willingness and fidelity. In all our service, a full surrender of self is demanded. The smallest duty done in sincerity and self-forgetfulness is the more pleasing to God than the greatest work when Mar was It looks to see how much of the Spirit of Christ we share, and how much of the likeness of Christ our work reveals. Revealed in others. He regards more the love and faithfulness with which we work than the amount we do. Only when selfishness is dead, when strife for supremacy is banished, when gratitude fills the heart, and love makes fragrant the life, it owes only then that Christ is abiding in the soul. We are recognized as laborers together. May the Lord give us that blessing. Selfishness is dead. Supremacy is banished. Gratitude fills our heart. You know, as we go through these weeks ahead, there's grace to help in time of need. I pray that we can, therefore, come boldly before the throne of grace. Because there's still work to be done. All of these people found grace and favor. They're hard workers. There's more work to be done. So as we work, as we labor, as we are a blessing to our co-workers, friends, and family, grace is so hard. 